Hi there, Market Insights Watchers. Well, in Market Roundup this week, big economic events are happening. So we have to stay tuned for what's happening this week there and what to watch. In tech megatrends, energy storage is booming. See where to invest. And in Crypto Corner, Ian has a Helium mobile update and also to delve into a list called the Good for Nothing blockchain list. Hmm, very interesting. We'll see what he has to discuss there. What a name, huh, Amber? Good I, for nothing. <laughs> good for nothing. Isn't that something? Well, hopefully it's nothing. But anyway, let's get to it. And please, while you're here, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, Ian, how are you today? How are things going? I'm good. I mean, just getting ready for this week because, you know, this is like one of those weeks where the market could move one way or another and could dictate really how we head into the summer months. Oh my goodness, yes. It's truly a confounding week. We'll see how it uh, pans out. So everyone in Market Roundup, it's all about the big economic events for the week ahead. First, please take a look at this week's economic calendar. On Tuesday, April's Consumer Confidence posts at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Now this index, which surveys approximately 3,000 U.S. households, records how consumers feel about the current economy and where they think it is going. Uh, the index's March reading was 104.7. Expectations is for a slight decline to 104. In general, readings below 75 are considered moderately pessimistic, while readings above 125 are considered moderately optimistic. So 104 would be about right there in the middle. On Wednesday, April's ADP employment change, which measures the number of employees on business payrolls in the private sector. Uh, well, the April final print will also come out for S&P Global Manufacturing uh, Managers Index and April's Institute of Supply Chain Management Index or ISM Manufacturing Print. And of course, the Federal Open Market Committee rate decision posts all this posts between 8.15 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern time. Now, of these indicators, all eyes will be on the Fed's rate decision, uh, which is expected to keep rates higher for longer. Uh, Chair Jerome Powell will host a press conference at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time that day, and he'll likely indicate that the median FOMC participant now expects less cuts uh, this year and may even take a more hawkish position of, of no cuts uh, as does the U.S as the US underlying inflation remains brisk at the time. So as seen in this chart, uh, which shows the change in US personal consumption expenditure core price index month over month or PCE, well, it indicates inflation adjusted consumer spending increased the most in a year. On Thursday, uh, March's factory and durable goods orders post at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Factory orders are expected to see a slight improvement while durable goods, well, they're projected to remain unchanged. And on Friday, Friday, the indicator of the month, uh, the April jobs report will post at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Now surveys anticipate a decrease to 250,000 uh, jobs from 303,000 in March with the unemployment rate remaining unchanged. And lastly, Ian, a couple of these economic uh, reports with the current earnings season, which so far uh, per Bloomberg data is showing that early results suggest about an 81% of U.S. companies are outperforming expectations, even against a backdrop of elevated rates. Uh, this is an increase over the same quarter last year. And Bank of America suggests that we may have a situation where, quote, if inflation is sticky because of momentum in the economy, that's not necessarily bad for stocks, but stagflation when the economy slows while inflation remains elevated is, end quote. So I, we discussed this possible stagflation scenario in our latest uh, investment team call, Ian. So what's your take? Do you foresee stagflation as a possibility, something that we should even concern ourselves with at this time? Stagflation is such a dirty word, right? I mean, we had uh, the main bout of stagflation in the United States was in the 1970s, where the rate of inflation was very high. However, the economy did not grow as fast. And, you know, there seemed to be some concern about it, especially after that most recent reading on GDP, which in the first quarter, which came in below 2% and inflation still, you know, above 3%. Mm -hmm. um, I think that 
stagflation is more of a problem when you have inflation at six, seven, eight percent, right? At three percent, the Fed's not too far away from their two percent target. I think a couple things too is going on. You know, we have a from the mid '90s to about 2020, there was massive amounts of globalization. So, you know, and that pushed, especially with the rise of China and and offshoring. Mm -hmm. A lot of our manufacturing over there, it pushed the price of goods lower. Now, as we start to bring goods back on shore mm -hmm. and they're making the United States, it's going to cost a little bit more, especially just funding this transition is going to cost more. And so to me, that's one reason why inflation is probably going to stay you know, above 3% and not get to the Fed's target unless there's a severe economic downturn. It just, you know, with that amount of government spending we've had in the last couple of years, that hasn't happened. Um, and, and and so, you know, we, I probably think that this year we're just going to see more of the same. Inflation stays above 3%. The Fed keeps hinting that they're going to cut. People decide that, you know, rates, the rate height cycle is done for now. The Fed's not going to go higher. And as long as the economy keeps trucking along, as long as you keep seeing, seeing how much CapEx spending is happening, especially in the tech sector, um, mm -hmm. as we start moving towards AI, you know, I think the market will do fine this year. And we've had a pullback since the highs in March, but that's typical for any bull market. You know, you don't the market doesn't go straight up. And we had this incredible rally from the October lows until mid-March. Um, and now we're just seeing basically a pause, which in my mind is something that refreshes. Mm. Well, well said there, Ian. Now, speaking of tech and AI, which you just mentioned, and tech megatrends of the global energy storage market is growing faster than ever. Now, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, deployments in 2023 saw a nearly three-fold increase from a year ago, of the largest year-on-year -year jump on record. Bloomberg NEF expects 67 gigawatts per 155 gigawatt hours will be added in 2024, up 61% in gigawatt hour terms. And all quote, energy storage is set for the first time um, to add more than 50 gigawatts of capacity this year. Uh, the uptick will largely be driven by growth in China, although uh, will be followed by the US, Europe, Australia, and Japan. Uh, the expansion is taking place against the backdrop of the lowest ever prices seen in the energy storage market, especially in China, uh, where turnkey uh, prices in February averaged $115 per kilowatt hour for two hour energy storage systems. Now that is down 43% from a year ago, end quote. So to get an investing foothold, I was thinking about this, Ian, in mm -hmm. this market, I suggest you please check out our strategic fortunes model portfolio. Uh, we've made uh, the op the connection, actually, that artificial intelligence, AI, will play a vital role in the future of energy. Hence, the term we have coined, AI energy. And AI energy will likely meant more millionaires than oil, coal, natural gas, wind, solar, as well as nuclear power all combined. Now, here are two ways to invest. Uh, first, Ian recommends buying advanced micro devices, ticker is AMD. AMD, why AMD? Well, as a way into this energy boom, here's what we're thinking. It's an innovative company that's developing technology that takes computational power of AI to exponentially greater levels. And as AI energy, that revolution unfolds, AMD's powerful microchips are set to be at the center of it all. Second, uh, check out Strategic Fortune's AI Energy Report uh, for stock recommendations in the space. Uh, please click the bull icon right here over my shoulder for all those details. So it's always good that we have something to, to pair with what's happening globally on a trend level. So AI Energy and that report is hopefully there for our subscribers uh, to invest. Thanks, Amber. Did you catch um, 60 Minutes on Sunday night? We did not, Ian. Tell me what happened. Well, they did a whole uh, segment on AI. Okay. And um, one of the things, I mean, they talked about some of the advancements in biology that will come from AI. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they they did mention, you know, the, the change in how much energy we're actually going to be needed to power mm -hmm. AI by the end of the decade. And then they also talked to a startup called Figure. Um, I thought this was interesting because we've spoken about this before. Figure is a a startup that makes humanoid robots. Mm. And um, you know, we we've been talking about 
how onshoring is coming. This is reminding me because we're talking about how prices are going up because we're bringing manufacturing back to the United States and away from China and other areas where it had been cheap for so long. And um, the the founder of AI, Brett Adcock, was saying how you know their goal is to ship a billion of these humanoid robots so that you know you have these factories where there's no humans working there. It's just robots making things. And they showed this robot that was like, it was smart enough that they, that they had a bowl of food in front of it. And the journalist said, Hey, you know, hand me something healthy. And the robot went and picked up an orange and handed him an orange just as like a human would. Wow. It missed on the second chance, but you know, they're still working out the kinks. Uh, it, 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 it got it the first chance. <laughs> uh, but then it, so it's, it's not perfect just yet. Um, but but they do have some partnerships with some manufacturing companies to to have their robots uh, working in there. And then the other thing with robots too, because we're talking about how in the future how are we going to fight this inflation? And the key is to have to have a more productive workforce. And to have a more productive workforce is like having robots and other automated things that can do the work of ten people, but then have one person running it. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there was a report out on Walmart saying that Walmart would save about $600 million a year by just replacing 1% of their workforce with robots. And, and to me, that's just, you know, mm. we don't even know where we're going with this at this point um, because the world in 10 years could be completely different than it is right now, just as the world we live in now is totally different than it was in 2014. Right. It's true. It, it goes so quickly, exponentially fast, but changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's turn to Crypto Corner. Ian, what's happening in Helium and what's happening with this with this blockchain list, a good for nothing blockchain list you mentioned? Too. Good for nothing blockchain. So let's start for, with Helium first. So, you know, everyone always asks like, what what is crypto good for? What are the use cases? Where is the adoption going to happen? And of course, you know, you know about Bitcoin being an alternative to money. And then we've talked about Ethereum being able to build other types of digital infrastructure with well there's a project that we've been following for you know five years now four or five years now it's called helium and um they started with these these are called miners and what this does this little device this was their first iteration it creates basically a wi-fi network in your local area and in doing so people can connect to your network not with you know, not this one wasn't for mobile phones, but it was for like sensor devices and and uh, data that did not need a lot of bandwidth. And if you set up the network, you would be compensated for it. So the token and the project allowed for people to be incentivized to build a Wi-Fi network in a local area. They've since moved on to uh, incentivizing people to build essentially 5G. And on top of that, Helium went, and created their own mobile plan, similar to like how Mint Mobile works, where sometimes they're using the Helium network that people built. Other times they'll be using um, the, the towers that that people are, all, uh, or Verizon towers and, and AT&T towers. And we just got a report out recently that talks about in the first, I don't want to ruin this, in the first uh, three months of the year, they added over 62,000 subscribers to their plan so people are leaving verizon signing up with helium and i think the plan is like five or ten dollars a month so it's a lot cheaper mm -hmm. and what one thing that's really interesting about this is because of this uh because people are using this plan it's called ca causing the helium token to be burned so when you're using data on the helium network the money that you spend on it is buying helium tokens and then when you're using somebody's 5g tower you have to compensate them. And so it caused about three, and this is not a lot, but it's just a start, it caused $3,000 of helium to burn per day mm -hmm. or per day for the data usage on Wi-Fi hotspots. So, you know, you can see how we're we're allowing for a crypto protocol to bootstrap a, a telecom network that can be competitive with Verizon and AT&T. And, and, you know, this is really small. So helium only has 62,000 subscribers. Just to give you an indication how big AT&T is, AT&T has 223 million subscribers, right? So it's in a totally different league, but you can see if they, let's say, double in the first quarter of this year, then double again, this could grow exponentially. By the end of this year, you know, they could have a couple million subscribers and people realize the cost savings they could use by using the Helium network. At the same time, the people who are building out the 5G of the Helium network, mm -hmm. as their more subscribers get added to it, 
they get paid more. And so it's it's really interesting to see a real world adoption of a cryptocurrency happen. Now, turning to a totally separate gear, I want to change mm -hmm. uh, gears here and I want to share my screen. Hold on one second here. So this was a report in Forbes and it's called the Good for Nothing Blockchains. And I just wanted to highlight this because, you know, in our crypto service, I try to drill this point down that you want to invest in crypto protocols that have lots of developers, lots of users. Um, the network fees are high, which means people are using the network. And they actually have a list where they have total network fees and market cap to fees. And, you know, there is one crypto asset that we have in our portfolio uh, that's on this list. The rest of them we don't, even though I get questions about Ripple and Cardano and Bitcoin Cash all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to justify why we own this specific crypto asset on the list, and I don't want to ruin it for subscribers of Next Wave Crypto Fortunes. But I just want to point something out. Cardano, for instance, took in $2.9 million in network fees in 2023. So it's trading at, and its market cap is almost 8,000 times higher, okay? When you look at Ethereum, Ethereum took in about $2.4 billion in fees in 2023 and has a $387 billion market cap. So you do the math. By the same ratio, Ethereum is trading about 161 times fees, whereas Cardano here is trading at almost 8,000 times fees. So, you know, you can see there's a number of these chains here that essentially are, you know, zombie chains unless they're able to increase their users dramatically. Um, and, you know, except for one crypto asset on this, uh, most of these I, I would, you know, largely stay away from. So I thought it was interesting that that Forbes did that analysis. And it also just reiterates a point that I, I always make where you can't invest in the chains that don't have any users or aren't growing their users or don't have a plan to grow their users. So some of these cryptocurrencies, especially the layer ones on here that have been around, you know, Cardano has been around since 2016. Uh, Internet computer has been around since 2018. Stellar has been around since 2016. Um, what else do we have on this list? Uh, Tezos and EOS have been around, but they never gained any traction. I would you know those are ones that you definitely want to stay away from. Uh, because it's really easy to fall into that trap where, you know, just because, let's say, the cryptocurrency is high on the list of the top 50 cryptos and has a low dollar price, right? You look at Tezos, which is, you know, trading at a dollar. You can buy that or you can buy Ethereum, which is $3,000. It, 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 you have to look at the actual value of Ethereum versus, you know, how much network fees it's generating. So I just wanted to share that list with everyone. Great information as always, Ian. Well, that's it for this week, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you very much. If you do have a question you'd like us to answer on next week's episode, please email us at marketinsights at banninghill.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amber. See you, See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.